And hello, everyone, and welcome to the Social Justice Forum. I am Darren Hyme, your host, and we thank you for joining us. Now, if you're asking the question, what is the show all about? Well, we bring you a forum that's discussing and providing a deeper understanding of the issues and inequities that so many people face in our community. Things such as systemic inequality, pressing social problems. Our guests provide multiple perspectives and insights, helping us better understand and address these challenges. So we invite you to stay connected to us as the Social Justice Forum begins right now. And welcome back. Lambda Legal is the oldest and largest national legal organization whose mission is to achieve full recognition of the civil rights of LGBTQ plus people and everyone living through with HIV through impact litigation, education, as well as public policy work. Now, the organization recently launched the Protected and Served Community Survey, exploring government misconduct and harm by police, prisons, school security, and courts against LGBTQ people and people living with HIV in the United States. And here now to tell us more is the Senior Attorney of Criminal Justice and Police Misconduct Strategist at Lambda Legal, He's also the author of Protected and Served, Richard Sines. And uh, Richard, good to have you. Thank you so much, Darren, for having me. And when we talk about this uh, advocacy and litigation, obviously your hands are full, but give us uh, your insight as to where we are right now, particularly when it comes to the rights of uh, the LGBTQ community. Are we seeing more and more tolerance in that area? I think there's been an increase in just understanding what the um, what the needs are of LGBTQ people and people living with HIV, be it through social change as well as um, affirming legal rights and protections. You know, we're, we've had major um, legal victories, but at the same time, we're also going through probably one of the most hostile and dangerous um, legislative sessions of of the past year across the country, where over 500 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced. A number of those became laws um, dealing with things like um, prohibiting or banning access to medical care for young um, transgender and um, gender non-conforming uh, non and non-binary people. We've seen an increase of violence against LGBTQ people, including some of our community spaces like uh, um, clubs, um, but at the same time that there have been a number of victories and just the idea that our community should be safe, that we will do what we can to keep each other safe, um, we've seen a, a, really a backlash. And Lambda Legal, we've always been at the forefront of fighting in the courts and, um, and um, legislatively. But we also need to recognize the importance of grassroots organizing the importance of people really coming together and supporting each other, because that is just as important as legal victories. It's the idea that we should treat each other with respect and dignity and also to keep each other safe. I know what you want to do is really get a lay of the land and see how things are. And so you came up and you have the Protected and Served Community Survey, uh, and it has some particular findings, but let's go through it for a second. Uh, why did you decide that you wanted to go ahead with the survey? We need information. We know if we're out there advocating that, um, yes, we can share the stories of our community members and things that they have gone through. Every time we file a new case, we're telling the story about our clients. Uh, but, but it's also important that we have this data to support what we are trying to get policymakers and other advocates to understand that from um, a community survey like Protected and Served, we're able to show that you know, uh, our survey reached over 2,500 people. Of those, a number of them reported that they had experienced government misconduct, be it by police or other law enforcement or their experiences in the courts or also in um, folks who have been in custody in prisons and jails. So these numbers, behind each number is a real person. And I think it's important that we are telling those stories as well as the stories that we're telling in court. When we decided to do um, Protected and Served, this was really a sequel to the survey that we conducted back in 2010, where the, the main question that we were, uh, in 2012, um, the main question we were trying to show was, 
is there discrimination and bias and government misconduct within the criminal legal system? And that 2012 survey, you know, found, yes, there is. With this survey, what we wanted to do was really explore what, what, the, what were those experiences like and what are some recommendations that uh, policymakers, community members, and people who work within the criminal legal system can take up and really try to not only um, lead to changes, but also to hold accountable those people within the criminal legal system who are causing these harms and to hold them accountable and to enforce these policies that might look good on paper, but if you're not enforcing them, then they're really not worth um, that much. When I saw some of the statistics, I know that one of the things is that three in 10 really don't have a trust uh, for police. I don't think that number is too startling, but yet and still it is concerning. It's very concerning, and, and I wish that you know, the, these are not, they're concerning, but they're not new. Um, I, I've been, since the release of the report, I've been meeting with community members, with um, other attorneys at, at different conferences across the country. And when I share these um, findings about the levels of trust, people aren't surprised. But I think it's, it's re a reflection of the need to um, think about these, these, um, these changes that we're pushing for in order to make sure that our community members' rights are protected, that people are not experiencing violence by government actors such as police officers and other law enforcement, and to hold them accountable. You know, one of the thing, one of the major things that happened as we were thinking about um, doing this protected and served community survey was the killing of George Floyd, um, the summer of 2020, as we were living through a global pandemic, um, we were also living through a, a parallel pandemic of police violence and, and racial violence. Um, we saw community members working to um, take care of each other, uh, but we also saw an increase in surveillance, increase in policing, and that really had a huge impact on, on top of everything else, of how people viewed um, their levels of trust with, with, with police and also this idea that the legal system is fair or that if you go to court that you will have your fair day in court. And I think those are important things that policymakers, judges, and people who are making decisions about um, policing need to really take into consideration um, and things need to change. Give me uh, your insight on this here because when we talk about having these numbers, three and 10 really don't really trust. You got to talk about reporting and being able to come forward. And we know that within this community, uh, whether it's a crime, whether it's reports of alleged abuse, things of that nature, those are sometimes hard to get across the table. When you're standing in front of a police officer to make that report, you say, mm, I don't want to make that report. I feel this distrust. But what does that do? I mean, uh, to a certain extent, it also undermines your your work because those statistics are very key and critical if you're trying to really make your voice heard. Thank you for, for raising that, Darren. I, I think one of the uh, arguments we have made in, in courts is if the community has a lack of trust or low levels of trust in these systems, and, and we asked that question about trust for the various government institutions, and I believe except for schools, over half of the participants had low level or no trust. So it's actually a bit higher if you look at it um, for all of the government institutions, um, not just, uh, and uh, except for schools where I believe it was close to that 50%. So it's, it wasn't doing great in terms of our community's trust in, in the school systems either. Uh, but it does undermine what we think about when, what, what if I do have to um, report a crime do I go to the police? Do I feel safe going to the police to, in order to do this? And I, I think what we also saw was that people were not reporting um, some of the certain types of crimes to police, such as sexual abuse or, or violence or intimate, intimate partner violence. And that's very, it's shocking to think about if the way that we can get some relief is to go to the police but people are concerned about their own safety and even reporting it to the police? Or is it a police officer or a law enforcement officer who's the one actually uh, perpetrating this crime? Um, that these are things that we have to consider. 
The other piece is if I have to go through the criminal legal system or through the court system, am I going to be safe or am I going to face discrimination at every step of the way, beginning with filling out the police report where we heard from some of our community members that when they interacted with police, even if they were reporting a crime, that they experienced some form of government misconduct, including uh, misgendering of trans or, or non-binary people, of sexual violence or, uh, or sexual harassment when they were reporting these things. So these are issues that we have known about for years. And there have been cases and there have been policy changes. But I believe we're now at the point of how do we hold these um, departments and these police officers accountable? And how do we enforce these policies? So I actually think of it that we're now <laughs> past this idea of criminal justice reform. And we're at the stage of how do we hold these, uh, these, these um, departments and um, government officials and people who work for these systems accountable. You, you talk a little bit in the report about racial disparities. And when you talk about racial disparities, particularly when it comes to people of color, when it comes to proof of immigration status, and there seems to be more in the area of communities of color that are being asked about immigration status. Give me some more insight into that, please. Uh, sure. And and uh, that, that was one of the questions we, we did ask people in the survey. And so for people who had face-to-face -face contact with police, 26% um, of the um, Latino or Latinx participants said that police asked for proof of their immigration status. Uh, this same thing happened to over half, around 56% of Black participants. And what we found were that people of color were more likely than white participants to be asked for proof of their immigration status. Why is this important? Again, if we're thinking about different barriers that people face um, in reporting or even seeing um, that police officers or police departments are places that they can go to to seek help, this is already something that's weighing on your mind of like, am I going to be asked about my immigration status where it's not relevant to the issue that I'm experiencing? But I know that can be, uh, that can have such a chilling effect on so many members of our community who have these concerns or you know, don't want to bother with being um, asked about things that are not relevant. And that's just an additional barrier. Thinking about people in New York City, of, of you know, if I live in the Bronx and I um, you know, ha have experienced a crime, am I going to go to the police or am I going to feel safe going to the police? if I'm also concerned that they're going to be asking about my immigration status or for things not relevant to um, what I just went through. We know that there has been significant changes that have been made in policy uh, and also in policing in the NYPD uh, across the city. But we know that some of those changes took place 2012, uh, and that was a huge, uh, a huge time stamp in terms of policies and procedures. Uh, where are we right now, and what have you found that since 2012, are some things still the same? And uh, have we gotten significant change, especially when we talk about, you know, advocacy and, and bias and those those hot button words that we talk about. Right, and and I, I think it is fair that we you know talking about it as these hot button button words, and for a moment there, um, there's a lot of interest and um, resources are given, and then there seems to be a lag off. And I think looking at 2012 to the um, this recent survey, the answer is there has been change, but more needs to be done, and it's the difference of until those numbers are zero in terms of people's experiences of negative um, conduct or misconduct, then there's still so much more work to do. Um, and celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall um, uprising, the police chief at the time, you know, did give a public apology. Um, the Stonewall, you know, uprising was about police violence. And I said in response to that, you know, thanks for the apology, but we need to see it on the ground. What are the changes that are going to happen? And I still think that's what we're living with. As we're seeing, um, again, thinking about the summer of 2020, the violence that our community members, and I'm thinking 
our full community, not just if you're looking at someone based on their 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 race or their um, sexual orientation or gender identity, because for many people, we can't and we don't separate those multiple identities that we have. But if the police officer is doing something that is violating my rights, as what was happening um, during the um, protests and organizing that happened during December of 2020 against police violence, then it still raises the question of like, what are we going to do to really hold these um, departments accountable for the misconduct that they continue to do? How many more studies do we have to do, or, or surveys do we have to do to show that this is a problem? Um, how many more times must NYPD get sued? How many more people have to die in Rikers before we say this is a priority and we must um, bring about change? Yeah, we got critics on the other side who say, listen, here's another survey. You guys throw out another survey. We got these numbers. They're telling, you know, it sounds like the same thing over and over again. But from your perspective, as one who sees the numbers, reads the numbers, and then also reads in between the lines, where do you go from here? We keep pushing for change. We keep suing. We keep using all of the resources we have to create this change where we're, again, we're, we're protecting people's rights. We're protecting their basic dignity. I wanted that all New Yorkers, uh, you know, uh, can be out in our community and be safe without having to think about if I get stopped by a police officer, am I going to... Uh, be harassed? Am I going to face physical violence or sexual violence? You know, if I'm in the court, am I going to have my fair day in court? And I think it, it's not too optimistic to, to think, of, think of it that way. But if we're really going to live within this system and our criminal legal system, then we as attorneys, as community members, we have to keep pushing for the, to holding them accountable and enforcing our rights and our own protections and keep at it because these little um, changes that we make in the long run are going to have a huge impact on what do we think justice is? What do we think um, it means to, to have impartial courts and for us to have our rights protected? You know, I've highlighted a couple of things in terms of the discrepancies that the police department have had in terms of like three and 10, uh, you know, people feel don't feel comfortable in going out and having a conversation with police or actually reporting. And we know what the what the follow up to that is, that sometimes people will just have hesitancy and not report. Uh, my question to you is, given the fact we've got these numbers, you hear what the people are saying. Uh, what's been the response of law enforcement when they've seen the survey, and uh, have they given you any any uh, insight? I have not received any insight um, from law enforcement. I, I'm open to having that conversation. Um, Lambda Legal, you know, we have represented um, law enforcement in in protecting the rights, their rights, in um, in discrimination cases. Um, but I I think at this point it's more. How do we get community members to be engaged with these um, various processes of, of calling for change? I want policymakers to look at these numbers when they're thinking about um, new legislation to protect the rights of LGBTQ people and people living with, um, with HIV, that they're not forgetting that a number of us do have interaction with the criminal legal system. Um, including prisons and jails, um, the courts and policing, and so that you have to think of of our experiences when you're when you're pushing for these new laws. Um, I, I think um, to to the point of what have law enforcement said about these numbers. Again, I haven't heard directly from people, but I hope when they look at these numbers that they see that behind each one is a real person and that this was their experience. What do we do in terms of countering the the, the real issue that we have in terms of having people be able to come forward to talk, to be able to share, because that's how effective change. You're talking about awareness. You're talking about getting out in the community and also letting people know. But we know that when we're in communities of color, the two biggest things that are barriers when it comes to these matters that we're talking about, immigration and the field for potential retaliation. How do you get best, uh, how do you get that word out to the community? Listen, don't you worry about immigration, don't fear uh, potential retaliation, but we need you to really be a part of this ongoing conversation to, you know, to, to try to break down some of these walls. Well, I, 
I wouldn't say that. I, I, I would say that these fears of, of harassment, of violence are, are real. Right. And, and these are valid concerns. So I, I would suggest that one of the recommendations we make is looking at alternatives to um, engaging with the criminal legal system. We had people report that for certain types of crimes that they did go to community um, um, organizations um, that were not affiliated or attached to um, law enforcement. You know, going to organizations um, such as the New York City Anti-Violence Project um, and and um, reporting incidents of, of of hate violence or intimate partner violence. I would um, push for looking at different ways that we can make sure that those community groups have the resources that they need so that... I got you, Richard. Keep going. So that we continue to look at ways of making sure that people are safe when they are reporting, that when they are within the criminal legal system, that they have the support and resources that they need. And really, I, I think the, the larger effect is that you're creating something that community members have, um, have a, a, a real buy-in for, and it's providing resources that go, to, uh, that go to these organizations that are doing really great things, not only just so that people can report, but that they're providing services and support for people who, who need it. We talk about the people who need it. Obviously, there's a lot out there that need the services. Uh, for somebody that's out there right now and wants to connect, and maybe they feel as though, listen, I've been violated, uh, or they feel like I've got a story to tell, my experience. How do they go about getting that experience to you uh, or to the necessary people so that way they can go forward with, with the action that they potentially may want to take? I would encourage everyone to um, to check out the report, and we have um, um, some um, additional materials. It's all at protectedandserved.org. Um, you can also, if, if you are someone who is um, um, living with HIV or LGBTQ and you are experiencing um, discrimination or bias, we do have a legal help desk that people can reach out to where we provide information and resources to people. Um, just thinking about some of the community partners that I have worked with in the past, I want people to know that um, the Legal Aid Society provides both um, civil and criminal um, um, resources if you're you know, dealing with a civil legal issue or a criminal legal issue. Um, legal Services NYC, the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Um, these are all great resources. And I also want to highlight that the Transgender Law Center, um, they put out a resource of how do you report uh, police misconduct. Again, that's the Transgender Law Center, and they have a resource on reporting um, police misconduct. I know we uh, had the transgender community on recently, and they shared sometimes, uh, we don't, and when they say we, meaning the heterosexual and the population of people who aren't transgender really don't understand the amount of discrimination uh, that goes on in their lives and sometimes uh, how we, through silence, actually enhance uh, the discrimination and the violation that they experience. Have you, can you, can you corroborate that? I, I think that's true, and and I think it's always important that we are centering um, people who are the ones who are experiencing it. So again, thinking about the use of resources, um, and another recommendation um, from the report is that we provide resources to transgender-led um, organizations so that people who are experiencing this experiencing this harm, we're not just centering them, but we're also giving them the resources that they need in order to address some of these harms that they're experiencing. So, Richard, before we go, how do people connect and uh, how do they get connected to the work? Um, again, please check out the report at protectedandserved.org. And you can follow Lambda Legal on all social media platforms um, at Lambda Legal. Definitely great talk about the intersectionality as well as some of the disparities that go on in our community. And, uh, you know, it's important that we highlight uh, what's happening, and also uh, the, the potential for change. And so thank you for being with us, Richard. Uh, great information, and of course, we'll continue to follow. Uh, thanks for being with us, brother. Thank you. All righty, taking a quick break. We will be back with more on the Social Justice Forum right after this. <laughs> We 
year back, the South Bronx's history since the 1950s is marked by deep-seated social injustices, including white flight, landlord abandonment, economic shifts, demographic changes, and the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway. These historical factors continue to shape the area today, giving rise to initiatives like South Bronx Unite. Residents of the South Bronx strive for fair access to clean air, nutritious food, affordable quality housing, and also health care, education, stable employment, and liv livable wages, plus a whole lot more. Here to share more, we've got the Clean Air Program Coordinator, Leslie Vasquez, with us. And uh, Leslie, good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. You know, I'm, I'm rambling down a list of so many things, but it's really an issue because when you think about uh, the issues that South Bronxites have faced for such a long time, um, I've, I've named about eight there, but there's so many more that you can name, but progress is being made. Correct. That's correct. So give us a little. Yeah. So uh, we represent the Mott Haven and Port Morris neighborhoods of the South Bronx. And we are located in a peninsula where we have no access to our waterfront. Um, our waterfront is ground zero for warehouses, polluting facilities like power plants, waste transfer stations. Um, we have three major highways crossing through the centers of our community. Um, on top of the lack of health service opportunities, um, on top of lack of employment resources, um, and many other things. Um, because of that, our community ha is extremely vulnerable compared to other communities in New York City. Um, we have one of the highest asthma rates in the whole country, and we have one of the lowest green space per capita um, in the city as well. Because of all of those injustices combined, our community has to experience cumulative health impacts like asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Um, and so what South Bronx Unite tries to do is tries to fix those issues so that our community isn't as vulnerable as they are today. Um, we want to be as resourceful, as proactive as possible. And the only way that we do that is through our community engagement and through the support of our um, community members and whatnot. Yeah. Sometimes community members have a hard time getting on board with advocacy only because they're so overburdened by what's going on in their own in, in their own lives. What are you finding among South Bronx sites these days? Because uh, as we know, um, the issues are many, but where there's strength, there's numbers, right? There's strength in numbers. How are you coming along in the strength in numbers fight? Yeah, so we try to be as active as possible um, with an organization of three people. Um, we are a little strapped in capacity, but nonetheless, we still try to um, have community engagement efforts every single month, especially throughout the, the warmer months. Um, and so we host community events monthly, um, and we collaborate with other organizations to do the same in other parts of New York City. Um, but the more people that we, uh, that we bring to our, our events, to, to provide purpose and intention to our programs, to collect their feedback, to better shape our policies and better shape our, our efforts moving forward. Um, that's what really guides our work. That's what moves us forward. Um, and so, like you said, it is tricky to get people to come outside and advocate when they're overburdened by everything that's happening in their lives. Um, but really, the South Bronx is so beautiful because it's so rich in culture. Um, everybody's always outside, there's always something going on. And even if you don't know about an event that's happening, you just happen to stumble across one. And so engagement is, is very, very lively in the South Bronx. Um, and although we would love to get many, many, many more participants um, to support our work and to, to see what we're doing, um, the participants that we do have now and the people who support our work are incredible people um, and they're residents of the area. Um, they experience all of these injustices firsthand. Um, and so we see that as great numbers, regardless of how many they are. So when you talk about being an organizer for the clean air, obviously we want to see better air in the South Bronx. We'll see a better air across the borough. We've, how much of these wildfires really impacted and further compounded uh, what we're seeing in the South Bronx? Yeah, um, because we have such a high concentration of pollution, the wildfires that came from Canada a couple of weeks back 
were so much more visible um, in our community specifically because we already had high pollution rates. Um, and so although the wildfires were experienced all throughout um, New York State and other parts of the country, the South Bronx had worst uh, air quality issues from before and we also had to deal with other cumulative health impacts in the past, meaning that when we had an extreme weather event like the, um, the Canada wildfire emergency, our communities were that much more vulnerable because they were already affected in other ways before. Um, we had higher hospitalization rates, like we do always, but um, with the Canada wildfires, it was that much more apparent how, um, how much of a disproportion there is with the resources that are available compared to other parts of the city. We hear a lot about the word racism. We talk about that here on, on, on the show quite, quite a lot. But when we talk about environmental racism, mm -hmm. that takes on a different type. Yes. Somebody may not be familiar with environmental racism. So let's educate viewers, first of all, on what is environmental racism. Yeah, so environmental racism is deeply rooted in the racist policies that we've had to deal with for, uh, for decades. Um, because of redlining, um, the South Bronx is considered as, it's not as desirable because of that, um, of that uh, stereotype that was placed for many years ago. And because of that, there has been less funding, there's less programs, um, and there is less consideration of the residents in the area. All of that uh, combined together has led to us becoming more vulnerable, and our environment is working against us because we don't have the government to help support us. Um, like I mentioned, we have higher rates of pollution. We have um, a high concentration of polluting facilities compared to many other parts of the city. And so all of these things aren't a coincidence. There is so much evidence that proves that our community, who is primarily of color, who is primarily low income, um, and who faces a myriad of different injustices, they're the ones who are experiencing the brunt of environmental impacts. They're the ones who are experiencing the environment at a completely different level than the rest of the people in New York City and other parts of the country as well. So when it comes to environmental racism, all of the, the historical um, impacts that our communities have had to deal with are combined with the externalities that our, our environment brings. And it, it doesn't help our case. Um, we are vulnerable because of the lack of, um, of prioritization that our communities get. And all of that together is, is receding us back. Yeah. And yeah, that's what we're trying to fight against. What about the response? Because as we sound the alarm, the question is whether or not anybody's come to aid mm -hmm. and whether or not that, that, that's going to be my needs are going to be met because we know that when you ride along the cross Bronx and you're stuck in traffic and those fumes are out there, uh, not only do they impact the driver behind, but it leaves behind that air that is breathed in by so many residents. And we know about the asthma. We know about high blood pressure and, 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 and all these other things that have been these health factors that are actually attributed. But when we sound the alarm, and we need the parties to be to come to the table and say, listen, we're going to do something about that. Where are we at? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the biggest contributor to pollution in that South Bronx area um, is uh, cars, trucks, and medium to heavy duty vehicles. Medium to heavy duty vehicles are essentially any uh, vehicle that is larger than 10,000 pounds. So any school bus, a large pickup truck, would be considered one of those. They're mostly run by diesel, which is extremely problematic in terms of the health impacts that it brings to the community. Um, and because, like you said, that exhaust lingers in the air, that's the air that our communities breathe. And so my role as a clean air program organizer um, is to transition the South Bronx to a fully electric um, medium to heavy duty vehicle sector so that we can reduce those levels of pollution, being that the warehouses, the, the, the highways, and everything um, in the area is contributing um, to that high rate of pollution. And so 
we at South Bronx Unite are trying to, to mitigate that issue by electrifying the vehicles that um, are impacting our area. And that's one aspect, but um, the city is also working on implementing a congestion pricing proposal, um, which is essentially going to redirect um, a whole bunch of traffic into the South Bronx. And we're trying to fight against that because we don't need any more pollution. We cannot make our communities any more vulnerable than what they already are. And so at South Bronx Unite, we're trying to, we are trying to avoid that issue of redirection of traffic into our area. Um, and those are some of the things that we're doing actively to, to prevent those things. How would public join in on this? Because obviously public support continues with, you know, the more the numbers, uh, the greater the, the squeak wheel gets the oil, right? So uh, how do we create the squeak, if you will, um, so that way we can be able to get more people out, active, combining uh, forces with South Bronx United? Yeah, so there are public comment periods, there's feedback discussions, there's community workshops for all of these efforts that are happening uh, for congestion pricing, for electrification, um, and for many other policies. Um, the best way that a community member can help is by being active in those engagement efforts, um, by providing that feedback, um, by, by voicing their lived experiences in the community. They're able to shape and hone the policies that we're trying to build. Um, and so being an active participant in engagements like those is super important. Um, we have a newsletter as well as many other grassroots environmental justice organizations in the city where we share those efforts, where we share action items that people can, can take on, like signing on to a petition or submitting a comment letter. Um, and so those are efforts that we try to do that help our community become more involved. Um, and you can sign up for things like those in our website or, um, or any other environmental justice organizations. The biggest question I have is when it comes to equity, right? We always have this conversation when we talk about social justice, equality, and equity. Two totally different things. Yeah. And, you know, while people will push the envelope and say we've got equality, the reality is that many times there's not equity. Um, and so how do we, why is it so challenging to see equity just in fundamental areas mm -hmm. where it seems like a no-brainer, but it seems like we've got to have five meetings and, and six conversations to be able to just bring equity to something that seems so regular. That's actually a great point because you mentioned that the Canada wildfires is something that um, is something that is pressing and we've had issues like the Canada wildfires, like that awful air quality, maybe not as bad, but the South Bronx always has bad air quality. Right. Um, and when you mention equity, why is it that this air quality issue becomes so important when it affects the rest of the world, but not when it affects communities of color that are vulnerable and have been historically marginalized like the South Bronx? When it comes to equity, we have to include communities that are marginalized, that are vulnerable first, and then address the rest of the world and the, the, um, the rest of the issues that trickle down to other communities. Not saying that other communi communities aren't vulnerable or that, that they don't need help, um, but our community has been suffering for so long. And again, we have so much proof that we are, our health is deteriorating on a daily basis because of environmental impacts that are outside of our control. Um, and so in order for us to do this equitably, we need to include communities members' voices and we need to address the, the communities that are vulnerable first um, because there's a lot of prioritization for other communities that are wealthier and that have resources and funds. Um, but they already have proper air quality. They already have green spaces. We need to address the ones that don't have any of that uh, consideration first. Right. And uh, so what's on your radar right now uh, that people can be paying attention to to say, listen, uh, I'm going to laser in on and possibly join the fight? Yeah. So we are working on implementing 25 air quality monitors throughout the South Bronx. 
um, with that data. We will make it publicly accessible. It's going to be transparent so that anybody can access it at whatever time. Um, there's a lot of air quality monitoring efforts throughout the Bronx and other parts of the city, but we really wanted to focus on having very detailed data for our South Bronx area specifically. Um, we will be moving forward with that work in the next couple of months, um, and we will be uh, adding stories to it. We will be implementing community members' voices and feedback so that it can back up our programs and it could justify why we are doing the work that we are. Um, and so, like I said, we have newsletters where we, um, where we provide actions that can help us move forward. And so to stay tuned, to stay active, um, we encourage people to participate in as many efforts as possible. Uh, well, Leslie, we gotta leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us and being with us. And we'll continue to do to follow the work. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate you. And we'll be back with more right after this. And we are back. Everyday Table is a food company transforming the food system to make fresh, nutritious food accessible to everyone everywhere. The company is forging a new path forward in the food equity space through our new health partnership, NYC Health. And joining me now is the CEO of Everyday Table, Sam Polk. And Sam, glad to have you with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Obviously, a great time for you. And uh, really, the work is going on. And you're really you know, transforming the food system here, trying to make food fresh and then nutritious. And, um, you know, it's a great work, but talk to me about what got you inspired in this. Actually, the civil rights movement. I I, I was, uh, in a past life, was a hedge fund trader until I picked up a, a book um, by Taylor Branch about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and was so inspired by the work going on there that decided that I wanted to find a way to make a contribution. And then, you know, cut to a year later, I've left Wall Street and my wife and I sit down and watch a bunch of Netflix food documentaries. And one um, really sort of started talking about this idea of food deserts and food inequality. And to me, it was just a simple idea that, you know, healthy food shouldn't be a luxury product. It should be accessible and affordable for everyone. When you think about it, there are a lot of food deserts, particularly, and it's hard to believe. I mean, let's, let's really get at it. I mean, when you think about being in the inner city, uh, to think that there's so many places where there are actually food deserts and they actually uh, exist. But we know the benefits of having food is that from a perspective, food is medicine. I'll throw the word out there. Food is medicine. How do you answer that? Well, I think that's 100% true. And the whole sort of like industry, the healthcare industry and government is really getting behind that idea. Um, the other side of it is that food or fake food can be poison. And, you know, the other thing I will say is that people talk a lot about food deserts, but I almost think about it the other way that there is, you know, there's really affluent communities where, you know, there's a whole food and a sweet green and 10 different, you know, places that are selling salads. But most other communities, not only inner cities and technically food deserts, but also sort of middle income areas that just can't afford to pay $18 for a salad on a regular basis, there's not many options there either. Yeah. And you, and you really say, listen, what can I do? And you're doing something about it. I mean, you've actually got, uh, you know, some, some, some skin in the game here. And when you talk about the skin in the game, you've actually got a storefront that's going up and, uh, it's right there by Jacoby. You got some healthcare workers and things of that nature. Somebody's gonna ask the question, why would you put a storefront up right there? Oh, well, I mean, Jacoby is, first of all, this is our 70th store, roughly. We have about you know 60 in Southern California and then around 10 in New York City. And two of those are, and soon to be five, are in major hospitals. And the one we're talking about is in the Jacoby um, healthcare center in the Bronx. And if you think about a hospital in the Bronx, it's sort of exactly what I'm talking about, where 
not not a lot of ton, a ton of healthy food options in the incredibly vibrant, amazing community that the Bronx is. And then also in the hospital, you know, you've got a whole big cross section of people. You've got doctors that may be making six figures, but you've got a lot of people that are, you know, staff that are making, you know, 20 bucks an hour, 30 bucks, you know, and then also patients. And for all of them, every table is providing, first of all, incredible food. Like that's the thing that I want. I would love for you to try it someday. It's like, it is really good. It all starts with that. And then you look at it and you say, and this thing costs $6. This meal costs $7. It's kind of mind blowing. Yeah, I'm on my way. Don't worry. I'm, I'm on my way. Trust me. But what I, want, what I want to get at is that you have this great pricing model, which really, when we look at society, the struggle sometimes is not just the accessible food, but that it's also the price point. Uh, but you're really dealing with that. So talk to us about how you were able to do that and why is it so hard for other people to do that? Well, it's well because it's really hard. I mean, that's the the basic thing. Like the way we make our food incredibly low price while having the highest quality ingredients and the best chefs making it is that we centralize production. So instead of having kitchens in every single store, we have a single kitchen and there's one in Brooklyn and there's one in Los Angeles. And at this kitchen, we're using automation and incredibly efficient operations to make from scratch fresh, healthy, delicious meals and then package them in grab and go containers. So then when you walk into the store, it's sort of like a pret. You know, you walk in, everything's pre-made, made fresh that day and you just grab it and we'll heat it up for you or it's a salad or a wrap and you just take it to go. Yeah. And then on top of that, we also vary our our prices so that we, we provide value to everybody. But if we've got a store like we do in, in New York, we've got a store in Chelsea. Um, so that's like a, you know, more affluent community. We're selling meals for eight bucks, but then we've got stores in Harlem and Flatbush and, you know, and the Bronx, and we're selling the same meals for six or seven bucks. And that's not to be clear about charity. That's just, that's because those stores are very profitable. It's about making it affordable and accessible for everyone and bringing value to everyone. But truth is, Value in Chelsea is a little bit different than what it looks like in the Bronx. You know, you do a great job, if you will, of marrying community and culture and then menu. And, I mean, that's intentional. Talk to me about the intentionality in those areas because you're taking community, culture, menu, and, and you're fusing it together and it's having great results. Well, you know, it's funny. When we started raising money for this, people would say, like, you know, you, you, know, you can't just bring in, you know, you know, healthy food and, and expect people to eat it. And I said, and we were saying, I don't know what you think that healthy food is, but we're not bringing like a celery and iceberg lettuce, you know, salad. Like we're talking about like Jamaican jerk chicken with coconut beans and rice and, you know, a chicken shawarma that is out of this world, like real food that celebrates the cultures and communities that we are becoming a part of. And that's for us is the idea where it's like, you know, healthy food, what we think of as healthy food, it, it should just be like real food that your grandmother would have recognized as food. And we'll just make that from all these different communities across LA and New York. You know, it seems so, uh, so easy, but it, the reality is it's hard work and you're really doing the hard work. Uh, when we see the results, obviously somebody's out there saying, this sounds great. I need it in my backyard. What about, what about expansion? Where are we going from here? I mean, look, our goal is to become the largest food company in the country and redefine the food landscape like McDonald's did. And that sounds about that in you know the 60s, there was no McDonald's. Like what we think of as normal has just been a development over time. And I think that as a country, we've we, all of us are coming to understand that you know, the food system and how it's changed has helped us in a lot of ways. Like food is now affordable and it's convenient and it's delicious, but for the most part, it's also fatal. And so if we can figure out a model, which we have to make food that is affordable and delicious and convenient and also healthy, that's going to change the world. What is What has been your take on the response that you've gotten since? I mean, obviously we see the expansion, but really to have a dedicated storefront, to see people actually be able to come through the doors and take part. What's the response that you're hearing from people, particularly when we talk about food insecurity and food deserts, and then they find a place like yours? 
Well, the thing is, I think the thing to understand is that, like, you know, when we're talking about this now, we're talking about food insecurity and food deserts and business models. But when people walk into the store, what they care about is I'm hungry. And no matter how cheap you make food, if, if I'm going to sell you, a, you know, a graham cracker with a piece of bologna on it, like even at 25 cents, you're not psyched about it. <laughs> but if it's amazing food you're going to be excited. And so that's what, if you look at all our Yelp reviews, which are, you know, above four and a half stars across the board, across all stores, that's what people are talking about. They're like, this food is amazing. And then they'll get to the price and the convenience and the mission, but it's just the food is really good. Sam, I want you to know you've got my whole staff in here hungry. Uh, they're staying with us right now, but they're really, they're about to check out because you know, <laughs> they're all hungry right now. But I, I want to talk about how, uh, this can be replicated, right? Because the reality is, is that you're really filling a need, and this is a need that we really have here in our community, uh, food deserts, insecurity, and you're able to really do that. Somebody's out there watching right now saying, listen, I just want to make an impact. How can somebody make an impact without replicating what you do? I mean, uh, it's the greatest form well, of flattery, don't get me wrong. However, but what can you do to really, you know, play our part in this? Well, it's a, it's a really great question. And we really thought about that. And the way we thought about that is has to do with franchising. And so, you know, when we looked at franchising, we said, you know, franchising is this great way to expand because you're, you're, you're utilizing the passion of entrepreneurs. They get to own their own business and it's actually better capital wise for the company. But the problem with franchising is like so many other industries, you have to have wealth to actually succeed in it. And we said, Said, look, you know, just like there's not a lot of healthy food in underserved communities, there's not a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurship if you don't have that cushion behind you. And so we've gone and raised, you know, I think it's like $16 million now in a franchise fund where we people come and work in our stores, they become store managers, then they become area managers. And when they're ready to take on a franchise, we take this capital that we've raised and lend them the money to be their own franchise. And so now you get the best of both worlds, which is this very efficient company that is going for big scale, but it's owned by people in the communities um, who are trying to lift their communities up just as well as we are. You know, they say you got your finger on the pulse. You got your finger on the pulse, brother. Uh, let me ask this, because you're, you're at a place, though, where you honestly are being able to do two things. You're, you can serve the underserved, which is part of what you want to do, but then also be a bridge in the affluent, and that isn't necessarily easy to do either. Well, that's the thing is, like, you know, we live in a deeply unequal world, and, you know... Los Angeles, where I live, has has neighborhoods that a certain kind of people grow and neighborhoods that are, are very segregated and, you know, certain other kinds of people go. And every table's core belief is that we're all connected and we're all inclusive and we're all, you know, there's differences in cultures, but at the end of the day, we're all the same. And so our challenge as a business is can we create a system that works for everyone but also links everybody together? And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. I have a favorite saying, everybody sees the glory, but they don't know the story. Talk to me about uh, the story of how you got here uh, to this place where we all are giving you glory. Uh, talk to us about the story, because it wasn't necessarily too easy. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the thing is, like, I think the food business is hard. The fresh food business is harder. And then the fresh food business at below fast food prices is probably the hardest thing you can do in the food world, not to you know, talk our own book. Right. So it's been a grind, man. I mean, like figuring out how to make incredibly delicious food is hard. Figuring out how to do it really efficiently is really hard. Figuring out logistics to get food from the commissary to our stores and to our customers. I mean, all of it has been, you know, I've got a lot more gray hairs than when I started. Let's put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. But when we talk about franchising, obviously the opportunity for entrepreneurship for some, right, and to be able to branch out on their own, this is huge because you're not just uh, giving consumers, you know, the product per se, but you're also giving people the opportunity for entrepreneurship and to be able to start your own, you know, your own business, which is sometimes hard, the, a very hard thing to do when it, when it comes to food service. And we know that the longevity in this business isn't always there, but you've got sustainability, man. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing is like, 
you know, we talked about how we're bringing our customers together, but we've also brought a lot of different kinds of capital together. Like we've raised money from pure venture capital who see this as the next McDonald's. And we've raised plenty of money from foundations who say, wait, 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 you're going to bring healthy food and underserved communities. And then also ownership opportunities. We want to be a part of that as well. And so I think every table is really a testament to, you know, you really, there are a lot of people that want to do good things in the world. And if you can get them together, you can create something pretty magical. How do you get them together? That's the question that everybody wants to know. You kind of like cornered the market a little bit on getting them together. What's been the secret sauce for you? I think it's just respect and humility on, on some level. Like, you know, we, I, you know, I guess I'm, I'm fortunate and because I spent a lot of time on wall street, but also spent a lot of time in the nonprofit world working in, you know, South Los Angeles, which is a neighborhood where per capita income is $13,000 a year. And just, I mean, coming correct in the neighborhoods. And that, that means, you know, coming correct into Compton, but it also means coming correct into the venture capital worlds and the foundation worlds and saying, you know, what is your interests and how can we align those with ours? Yeah. And so when people want to get connected and they want to find out more or, you know, listen, say, listen, my community could benefit from you. What do they do and what's the criteria? Well, I think, first of all, they can visit everytable.com to learn more. Um, if they're interested in the entrepreneurship program and the social equity franchise, they can just go apply for a job at an Every Table store because everybody has a shot to get into that program. And then if they want to ask me questions, they can email me at sam at everytable.com. Yeah, it's been great talking to you, brother. I mean, really a, a great work. 2024 is coming up. I mean, obviously, you got some great thoughts ahead. Uh, give us some insight into 2024, what you're looking to do. Look, we're just going to keep growing and getting better. And by getting better, I mean making our food better and making our food cheaper. And the way we figure it is that if we can just keep making the food better and also cheaper, everything's going to work out. Love you, brother, man. You're doing great work. Sam Polk, CEO, we thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All righty. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, that about wraps it up. But before we end our program, I want to let you know, BronxNet is thrilled to mark 30 years of positive impact in the borough of the Bronx. Our latest venture, the BronxNet Media and Technology Studios in the South Bronx, represents our most significant step yet in bridging the digital gap. However, we can't do it alone, and we do need your support. So your contribution ensures access to cutting-edge studios, top-quality equipment, and professional development opportunities for individuals of all ages in the Bronx. So join us in shaping a brighter future in technology and media. We encourage it. Let's work together to make the Bronx a better place for everyone. And you can donate today at bronxnet.org and we can create a lasting impact together. Well, we come to the end of our show today. We hope that you enjoyed this week's discussion on the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forum. Now, if you want to rewatch this week's edition, you can catch ReCableCast right here on bronxnet.org. And if you want to join in on the conversation and present your point of view, that's very important, your point of view, make sure you hit us on our social media, at BronxNet TV. Join us next week. We're going to continue to elevate the discussion and bring further awareness across the globe. I am your host, Darren Jaime, saying take care, God bless, and we'll uh, see you soon.